main room topic, which you'll see by soon. I think it'll become your, one of your favourites as well. Thank you, Lord. Father, I just pray that you would just refresh us, Lord. Refresh us as we come into this uh, last session for the afternoon until the evening. Open our hearts and minds to receive your truth to take hold of your truth and to learn to apply it in our lives. Lord, bring us up into our rightful position in you. Thank you, Father. We just welcome your presence. Would you just move amongst us, Holy Spirit? Let us feel your presence. We want to feel your presence. Thank you. There really is a beautiful presence the Holy Spirit in this church. It's just lovely. It's a delight, a delight to be here. Okay, this next topic is binding and loosing. You would have heard that in the, in the Bible, binding and loosing, and I'll pull it apart a little bit for you. And it really is, I think, maybe it's a stronger gift for my life. I'm not sure, but I really am passionate about it. God has given each of us spiritual territory. We are born into a royal family. We're kingdom people. You've got the crown here. That's what that is, isn't it? Crown. And we're called to exercise dominion on God's behalf. Did you know that? Because we are his ambassadors and we are his representatives. We speak on his behalf. He has given us authority to speak on his behalf. Whether or not we choose to take that up is up to us. But you have authority. Psalm 8, verses 3 to 6. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honour. You made them rulers over the works of your hands and put everything under their feet. Rulers over the works of his hands and put everything under our feet. This authority is also given to us in Matthew 16, 19 and Matthew 18, 18. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So what does it mean to bind and to loose? Well, it simply means to bind, to forbid by an indisputable authority, and to permit by an indisputable authority. Now we all know what that indisputable Authority is, don't we? Jesus Christ. We have the authority of Jesus Christ to forbid and to permit according to God's word. Christ in heaven ratifies what is, what is done in his name and in obedience to his word on earth. Okay, in obedience to his word. So we can't just start willy-nilly doing what we want if it's not in obedience to his word. Both Matthew 16 and 18 make clear that what you bind on earth would have already been bound in heaven. What you loose on earth has already been loosed or permitted in heaven. In other words, Jesus in heaven looses the authority of his word and it goes forth on earth to the fulfilment of its purpose, of his purpose. But far too often it is the enemy, through his deception, who rules over us. Would you agree that often it just seems like the enemy is ruling? It's not God who's ruling, it's not us who's ruling in a particular circumstance, in our relationships in our workplace, in our health, in our finances, with our children. 
And in our thought life, that's a big place. That's a huge battlefield in here. We need to be ruling in here. But far too often it's the enemy who rules with his lies and we come into agreement with those lies instead of forbidding them, we simply agree with them. So what are the keys to mastering this? Okay. The first thing that we need to master is ourself. Our thought life, our eating patterns, our emotions, our anger. You know, it's okay to get angry in a righteous way. It's not okay if somebody just started getting angry now and started ranting and raving. That's not okay. We need to learn self-control. We need to learn to master our speech. We have authority over ourselves. We have authority over our spouse. Did you know that? In a good way not in a dominating way. We have that one flesh relationship. Everything pertaining to my husband, if he's having problems at work, then I have authority to start binding and loosening in that area because it's in relationship to me. If he's having problems with his health and I think it's the enemy, or if he's having problems with his speech, or me maybe, then I have authority to start binding and loosing. That's my area of dominion. That's not your area. Your area is your spouse. My spouse is my area. I have authority when it comes to my children because my husband and I are their covering. God has given us authority over them, so when the enemy starts to mess with my children, then I have authority to deal with him. Over, over my finances, we need to learn to master our finances instead of letting them master us. In the workplace, if there's problems in the workplace, if there's um, disharmony, if there's lack of honour, gossip, slander, bullying, you have an authority to exercise your dominion in that place, all of those things are not of God. Bullying, slander, dishonour, it's all of the enemy. And God has already said, I've found those things in heaven. They've been bound in heaven. So now you take up your authority and bind them on earth. You have authority over your belongings, your home, your vehicle. And you have authority in the area of your ministry and in your church. So what do we need to do? We need to repent of judgments that we have made towards our spouse, towards our pastors, leaders in the church, towards our boss, towards our children, towards ourselves. Psalm 66, 18 says, If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God has surely listened and heard my voice in prayer. If I have a bad attitude toward my boss, toward my pastor, toward my children, then that takes away my authority. Because I'm cherishing sin in my heart, and therefore God won't hear my prayer. I need to decree that the powers of darkness be bound, banished, forbidden to operate in the name of Jesus. And then I need to release the presence and the blessings of God. So you're just releasing the opposite. If there is division, then you're releasing unity. If there is rebellion in your child, you are releasing obedience. You're releasing the opposite. To advance the kingdom in any given area, we must first bind the powers of darkness. Because if you don't bind the powers of darkness, you're just kicking up against the wall. You're not getting anywhere. You need to bind them, and then after you've bound the powers of darkness and release 
the presence of God, you can integrate the natural with the supernatural. For instance, if I have a rebellious child, I bind the powers of darkness, and then I put boundaries in place for my child, and I make sure that they don't cross those boundaries. So I'm integrating the supernatural with the natural. You need both. I'll just give a testimony now um, of when I really, when I first started really becoming strong in this area. About, um, probably about nine years ago, uh, my eldest daughter, who was 15 at the time, well, let's say going back a little bit before then, she was a really strong Christian, very strong. I mean, she would have little prayer meetings with her friends from probably about age 14. And they all spoke in tongues and they journaled and the books were piled high for journaling. She heard from God, she prayed for people, she loved the Lord, she went to all the youth meetings, she was in church all the time, she just lived and breathed Jesus and she had a dream one night and she shared this dream with me and she said, Mom, I was up on the stage and the stage was on fire and I was up there with Reggie Dabbs, who's a when our youth pastor, and she said, I was standing in the fire and I was preaching to the youth. And I was so excited, you know, because I was first generation Christian. I was the first Christian in, as far as I know, all my generations, and then my parents became Christians. So I'm passionate. I was passionate then and I am passionate now. And it was exciting for me that my generations had changed for God. And then uh, one night, my husband and I got a phone call to come over to this gentleman and his wife's home to talk about our daughter, that something was going on. And we went over there and sat down, and these people weren't Christians, and so um, that made it even more difficult. And this gentleman uh, shared, we had noticed actually become, becoming a little bit rebellious, and he shared with us how our daughter and his son were in a sexual relationship and his opinion was that it was okay, that they were adults and Ashley and their son were sitting there and he said that as far as he, con he was concerned it was okay but they thought that they should let us know. Now you can imagine how I felt. Just my husband and I were in just absolute shock. We didn't know how to answer them. We didn't have God in common. Their, their values were totally the opposite of ours. I couldn't muster up any words but to say to him, it's not okay. It's not okay. My husband was fighting everything within him not to get up and punch that man down. Because, I mean, any father here would know how that feels when your daughter is just stolen from you. So we got up and we left. We didn't speak with them. We just said it's not okay, and we tried talking a little bit. It wasn't working. So we just thought we'd leave. And Ashley came home, and she began staying at their home a lot, four nights a week. She was sleeping at their home, and it was just awful. Our home became the battleground of fighting, yelling, demanding, being demanding that we stop. And just was not working. I wasn't tackling it spiritually because I didn't know how to. I was ill-equipped, I was absolutely powerless, and I would go up to my bed every night and just lie in the bed and just cry, and cry, and cry, and went on for a week of me just crying, God, oh, what happened? I can't believe this has happened. The devil has robbed me, and why did this happen? I'm beating myself up, and myself off from my other children, my husband, it was just absolutely devastating. I said to Ashley, if you're, this is really hard, and I regretted it after I said it, but anyway, it turned out right, we all make mistakes. I said to her, if you're going to stay at their house for that week, maybe you should move in with them. So she did. She moved in with them. I got worse after that. Now I, now I didn't even know what was going on at all. It was just absolute hell and up and crying and whatnot. So she moved in and then, of course, I kicked her out. That was how well, she threw that back at me. One night when I was lying on my bed crying, 
I feel, I believe that I heard the audible voice of God. And this is what he said to me. What are you going to do about it? And I was shocked, really just shocked me. And I had this sword. I had this sword that my friend had given me. We went to a conference together and the sword was the word of God. And, you know, I like to have visual things. So I had this sword and it's up on the duchess in my room and I got off the bed and I snatched it off the duchess. Something came into me when I heard that voice. The grace of God, the power of God. I grabbed my sword and I stood up on the bed. Wait here for so I stood up on the bed and I just felt like the devil was right in front of me and I said to him, you cannot have my daughter. God gave her to me. I gave her back to God when I dedicated her to him. She belongs to God and I declare, and I remember the dream she had and I started professing all the things all the promises just came flooding back into me. You know, over that period of time, I've got a lot of promises. And I started declaring all of those promises and I started getting really fired up and I took hold of the promises and I thought, no, I am in a battle and I am going to win this battle. So night after night, I went up to my room and I grabbed my sword and I declared and I started. I knew a little bit about binding. I started binding the enemy, binding his power, forbidding him to have any authority over my daughter. I said to him, I will spend the rest of my life serving God, seeing souls one and people set free to get me back. And within a week, I had a dream that she, she was on a bus. And I got on the bus, and she was right at the back of the bus, and I went up there, and I was begging her to get off the bus. And she wouldn't get off the bus, and the boyfriend was there, and he was mocking, and her hair was all falling out. And she wouldn't get off, so I got off the bus, and as I got off the bus, this vicious dog got on the bus. I believe that God was saying, you know, she just opened the door to the enemy, she's chosen this path, but God showed me that he was in control about a week later. We met up, I met up with her, and she said to me, my hair is falling out. Now, I was excited. I thought, God's doing something. I knew that stress causes your hair to fall out, but I was, I was pleased that she was stressed because it meant that it wasn't okay. It meant that she wasn't an adult. And I said to her, your hair's falling out because you're stressed and you're not an adult. This lifestyle is not for you. You can't cope with it. You're not emotionally ready for it. It's not God's plan for your life. And I, as I said, I started binding the enemy and I had to really integrate the natural here. And God placed this woman in my life to speak to me and she said, you have to aim to love your daughter. Even though it is very difficult, it became hellish in our home. And other children were crying all the time as well. And they see the mother and they pick up what's going on. Um, they were devastated. Everyone was shocked. I felt really angry with her. I felt like I was despising her, the trouble she caused. It was hard to love her, but I chose to love her and I started buying her gifts. And I started telling her what she meant to me and what our hopes for her were and that I reminded her of the dream she had. She didn't like it that I reminded her, but I said, God gave that dream to you as a promise to me. It was hope, and I believe that that will happen. So as the weeks passed, she became increasingly more stressed. They only had boys in that family, so she became like the housemaid, and it was all just too much. She didn't have to do much at home. Um, so... As it increasingly became too much, she asked if she could come back home. And we welcomed her with loving arms, but I said to her, you, you are most welcome to come back home, but nothing's changed. It's exactly the same as when you left. We love you, 
we are Christians, we honour God above all, and these are the boundaries. She stayed in a relationship, but she respected the boundaries that we have, and over a period of months, the relationship began to disintegrate, and she came out of that relationship. To this day, she doesn't even like to talk about it. She's embarrassed. She says, I don't understand what came over me to cause me to do that. And she said to me only a couple months ago, I hope that I never have doors because I don't want to go through what I put you through. Praise God, she, she's not going to church, but she's back with God. She's back in relationship. She prays, she asks me to pray with her all the time. When she comes to visit, she lives in Sunshine Coast now. When she comes to visit, we go through forgiveness prayers, cutting up what we I, I, I do the whole lot. She won't come to the healing room, so I'm bringing it to her. She goes through all of these um, things with me. She's got a, a lovely boyfriend. He's not a practicing Christian, but he is a Christian. So I'm just believing now that God is going to do the finish work. You see, it's a process, and I'm okay with that. I'm not fretting anymore. I'm not panicking. I'm just standing on the promise. God's bringing her back slowly, but surely he's bringing her back and her, her um, testimony will be a powerful message when she gets up on that stage and preaches to the youth, whether it's with Reggie Dabs or just in any church, it will be powerful because she's lived it. I believe that I have won because I stood up and took my authority, but if I hadn't, who knows? Who knows? what would have happened. And initially, you know, it was really hard. It was hard work. It seemed like it took great effort for me to do that. But as you do it, over time, it becomes a part of who you are. It becomes second nature to you, and it's no longer difficult. If you're in a, a sticky situation, you find your mind goes there straight away. Oh, fine, that's good. Anger, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I just release your peace. And that's it. And you, you watch the atmosphere in the room will begin to change. Well, my area of authority, my dominion, is not yours, and yours isn't mine. God has given each of us our areas, our areas of authority, and he has equipped us to exercise our authority in that area. Sometimes people are afraid to pray this way. I have one friend who's who won't pray this way because she says, oh no, everything, all the backlashes from the enemy come against me when I pray this way. Well, I don't believe that only happens when you step outside your area of authority. I mean, it's not my authority to start praying for change in someone else's marriage unless they have invited me to come and stand with them and pray in that area. Then the enemy may well come against me because that's outside of the boundaries. So if you stay within your boundaries, you won't experience those horrendous backlashes. The enemy will always be after you because you're a Christian. He wants to mess up your life. But all of these tools, these prayer partners that God has given us, we can rise up above and conquer in all the areas. He will always make an attempt, but if you never step out for God, He'll leave you alone. But you, you'll feel defeated. You'll feel like you haven't fulfilled your purpose. You'll feel empty. There's no greater reward than stepping out. Yes, you might get it. A few things happen, but seeing the victory of changed lives, it far outweighs that. Ephesians 2.10 says to us, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Okay, you have good works to do, I have good works to do. 2 Corinthians 10.12, in the CJB version, we don't dare class or compare ourselves with some of the people who advertise themselves. In measuring themselves against each other and comparing themselves with each other, they are simply stupid. Now, as we said with the tape measure, it's, you don't compare yourself with someone else. You never compare yourself with someone else. We are in a journey with God. We're meant to be assisting each other, 
growing together, rubbing shoulders with each other, learning from each other, growing together. If you um, need help in your area, then you invite your friend in to help you so that you can learn how to grow in your dominion. We are unique in our sphere of influence. Another testimony um, with regard to my husband in his workplace, there's been a lot of um, a lot of turmoil in his workplace, competition, you know, that he works as a supervisor, and one of the other supervisors who he is friends with um, kept undermining his work. They would set things up and my husband said, when I disappear for half an hour to do something else, I come back and he's changed everything. And he said, it's continually happening on a daily basis as if there's some sort of competition going on or, you know, a pecking order. And he says, I just don't know what to do about it. This man's daughter uh, died in a car accident and a couple of years ago he said, I don't want to upset him. I feel bad to confront him because I don't want to upset him. And I said to him, you know, it's awful that his daughter passed away, but you can't use that year in, year out as a reason not to address issues. I said, but first of all, why don't we pray about it and stand against it, find it, forbid it from happening, and then go and talk to him after we've done that. So together, we prayed that way, and he didn't even need to go and talk to him. It just simply stopped. Just completely stopped. Even in your relationship with your spouse, you know, you're having an argument together and one or the other might get a bit heated and over the top and I just leave the room, go to the bathroom or my bedroom and I just find out what it is. Anger, um, confusion, you know, misunderstanding, whatever it is that's going on that I sense in the atmosphere, I find it, I forbid it to operate, I release the opposite and then I come back to talk about it again. It's amazing how God steps in. You know, you still talk it through, you still deal with it in the natural, but without the influence of the spiritual forces. Change comes. You can alter the spiritual atmosphere in the place that God has given you as your area of authority. Matthew 12, 29. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can plunder his house. First we have to tie up the strong man. Luke 10, 19, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. That's what God says. Nothing will harm you. The enemy will make an attempt to harm you. He might frighten you. He might make you feel like you're being harmed. But God says he cannot harm you. He's just bluffing. You stand your ground, get someone to stand with you, and resist. It's just a bluff. Okay. We might ask God now to begin to, to speak to us and show us if there's an area in our life where we need to take authority. Now, remembering that you need to recognise your sphere of responsibility. Maybe you haven't been taking up your authority in your home, as you should be, or in your workplace. Maybe you've been allowing people to intimidate you. Well, firstly, we need to repent and embrace it in your heart. Okay. Forgive the boss. Forgive the wife. If your pastor has offended you, forgive your pastor. You can't embrace something in love and then have a bad attitude toward it. Once you embrace it in love, your attitude toward it will change. So I just want you to picture now your area of dominion where maybe there's been some problems in your home, in your workplace, in your ministry, maybe just your friends. If you're willing, just hold them in your heart now and deal with the hurt, the 
deal with the anger and deal with the grief. Just pray after me. Father God, I forgive. Can you just say who that is? I forgive them for. Just in your own words, what do you forgive them for? Now you're positioned to speak to the mountain in the spirit. Well, let's pray together. I take authority and dominion over you. Now name what it is. Division, lack, unrest, rebellion, strife. I refuse you permission to operate in the name of Jesus. You are bound. Now just release the officer. That's it in a nutshell. It's simple. As you begin to exercise it, you won't even need to play cards. It will all be in here and in here, and it will be second nature. Now, if you would like to increase your discernment, we might pray for you now that you could begin to discern the spiritual atmosphere instead of going to work and thinking, oh, I hate this place. You know, everyone's carrying on. Maybe sometimes there's pornographic material on the tables, maybe there's anger, competition, resentment. Instead of going in and just seeing that, you can discern the atmosphere. Oh, there's a spirit of anger in this place, there's division, there's lust, there's lust in this place. You've discerned it and now you can take authority over it and forbid it to operate. But you need to train your mind to start discerning what's in the atmosphere instead of just seeing what's in the, in the natural. Okay, so put your hands out in front. Stand up here. We'll stand up. Switch the legs. Let's pray together again. Father God, I invite you to increase my discernment. Increase my ability to risk my discernment. with friends and family and practice discerning good and evil. I hand to you fear. I don't have to fear what I feel. I can get excited because it's a word of discernment. I can come over the spiritual atmosphere instead of under it. So, Father God, I receive from you increased discernment and a spirit of peace. Now, we might pray as well, if you would like to strengthen your ability to stand in any spiritual atmosphere. You know, if you're around um, people who were, yeah, I got on a bus recently, I went to Darwin, and a whole lot of people got on, and they were all drunk and carrying on. I was like, oh, oh, I really feel out of my comfort zone. And I thought, I can be okay. God's here with me. I can just take authority over it and be protected, and I did. And it was fine. You know, I don't need to shrink into fear 
that now this thing has power over me. Okay, let's pray again. Father, I repent. I have not discerned the atmospheres. And they have tossed me to and fro. I have fought against flesh and blood. And not, and not understood that it's about the forces and the atmosphere. I repent and I forgive anyone in my life that has joined with the negative atmospheres and slimed me. I release them now. Holy Spirit, I invite you to give me courage to stand and I prophetically declare that when I've done all that I can do to stand, that you, Holy Spirit, will make sure that I stand. I repent for any way that I've come under the atmospheres instead of releasing the kingdom. When hopelessness comes, let me release hope. When despair and sorrow comes, let me release life. When fear or anger comes, let me release peace. When division comes, let me release unity. Father, train me by your spirit to represent you well in my home, in my church, in my workplace, in my ministry, and in my community. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen.